This um, program is a follow-up from the previous one on the Dead Sea Scrolls and relates to the place where the scrolls originated, namely Quamran, which is in the area of all the caves where the scrolls were, um, were found. As a result of the task force combing the, cl uh, the cliffs at Quamran, many caves were located and more interesting material came to light. In one cave, coins minted during the time of John Hyrcanus, about 135 BC, were found. This provided another clue regarding the age of the scrolls. Tests at the Chicago Institute of Nuclear Studies showed that the scrolls must have been uh, written between 167 BC and 233 AD. And uh, other evidences also point to a BC origin. In another cave, this one here, a mysterious roll or scroll of thin copper was found, broken into two pieces. This picture on the screen at the moment was actually taken at the time that the discovery was made. The scrolls were carefully brushed to clear away the dust and debris on and around them, revealing that they were made of copper. Most of the scrolls were made of leather, of course, so this lone copper scroll, broken into two pieces, really perplexed the uh, experts at the time. Because it was so oxidised and brittle, the scientists couldn't unroll it and uh, read it. <coughs> Originally, it was made up of three strips of copper riveted together. For about four years after they were discovered, they remained closed and unread because nobody knew how to unroll the metal without shattering and destroying it. But finally, ingenuity triumphed. A way was found of getting around the problem. A Mr Baker of the Manchester College of Science and Technology in England, who you see here, coated the brittle scrolls with uh, plastic. He did this to prevent shattering then sliced them into trough-like leaves with a tiny uh, power saw, the blade of which was only 0.15 millimetres thick and was normally used to split pen nibs. <clears throat> Not one letter was lost on the copper scrolls as a result. The length of the roll was nearly two and a half metres, that's about eight feet. <clears throat> the message on the copper was quite exciting because it gave a list of hidden treasure belonging to Jews which had been buried away in various places probably to elude the invading Roman army which overran Palestine around AD 70. Each treasure was given its carefully tabulated location but um, unfortunately uh, landmarks have changed so much over the past 2,000 years that they are not now recognisable. The uh, scholars who deciphered the um, copper scrolls have kept the instructions on them completely secret for fear of an invasion of treasure hunters in the uh, area. It's possible that those 429 objects of copper and ivory, some of which we saw earlier in the previous programme, found south of En Gedi in the uh, cave of uh, treasure, as it was called, uh, that they could have been among the treasures referred to on the Copper Scrolls. They were actually found as a result of a uh, thorough and systematic search of all the caves between Masada and Engedi, which was sparked off by the discovery of the Quamran Scrolls. As mentioned previously, during March and April of 1960, and uh, 1961, four well-organised Jewish expeditions explored the valleys and caves in the uh, area. Some 100 soldiers and 300 civilian volunteers took part as well. Israeli Defence Forces provided equipment, campsites and all supplies. <clears throat> Many of the caves are not visible from above and at the canyons, 
are as much as 275 metres to 365 metres, that's 900 to 1200 feet deep, and uh, they're not visible from below either. The two openings in the middle of this photo are known as the Cave of Letters, due to letters that were um, found there. Two helicopters were required in order to locate such caves and to um, photograph them. Volunteers were let down the cliff by rope until opposite the cave mouth and sometimes had, had to swing <coughs> backwards and forwards until able to jump into the cave mouth. <coughs> caves were given names relating to some significant discovery made in each one and this is how the Cave of Treasures got its name. Other names given to caves were the Cave of the Vultures, the Cave of the Bats, uh, the Cave of the Pool, Cave of Letters <coughs> and Cave of Horrors, etc. The Cave of Horrors was one in which 40 Jewish fugitives were trapped because the Romans had pitched above them. They ran out of water <coughs> and made a bonfire of their possessions and then they committed suicide rather than surrender to the Romans. The approach to this cave, as you can see, also involved rope and uh, rope ladders. It led into a large chamber measuring 36 and a half metres by 27 and a half, that's 120 feet by 90 feet, and 13 and a half metres to 18 and a half metres high, that's 45 to 60 feet high, infested with bats and the stench of bat dung. A grim sight confronted the explorers. In a recess along the wall was a collection of large sized baskets overflowing with human skulls. And in a corner, layer upon layer of large mats covering human bones. This cave had obviously once provided human shelter on a considerable scale. They too were encircled by the Romans, starved out and killed themselves as at Masada rather than surrender to the Romans. Letters from Bar Kokhba, leader of the Jewish freedom fighters during the second century AD were also found here giving various instructions to those who were uh, under his command. Here we are again at the Cave of Letters to which the excavators returned in 1999 and 2000. Unlike their predecessors in the 1950s and 1960s, the latest team didn't need to rely on rope ladders to gain entry. The aluminium ladder seen here rests on a narrow ledge about 10 metres below the cave's uh, two entrances. In this picture, we see a, um, a sickle that was found in a basket on the first day of exploration in the cave in 1961. Also found in the basket were wooden bowls, a woman's sandals, keys and cutlery. Beneath the basket lay a goatskin filled with 35 papyrus rolls, which proved to be legal documents belonging to a woman named Babatha. It's believed that the cave had been a hideout for Jewish rebels. All in all, scores of caves have been searched and excavated, and the remains of 500 to 600 manuscripts, or large portions of manuscripts, and multiplied thousands of fragments were found by various expeditions down the top half of the western shore of the Dead Sea. The scrolls were all religious, some in Aramaic, some in Hebrew, and a few in Greek. Over 100 of them are copies of parts of the Old Testament. They include at least 17 copies of Isaiah, beside the one found in the first cave, and more than two dozen copies of Deuteronomy. Judging from the number of copies found of each book of the Old Testament, the most popular ones seem to have been Genesis, Deuteronomy, Psalms and Isaiah. Every book in the Old Testament had a place in the collection except the book of Esther. 
This book may have been left out due to its lack of reference to God and religious teaching, or because Esther, being a Jewess, married a Gentile king. There were no religious books found in the Qumran caves that do not depend on the Old Testament. So we know that the people who owned them were a group of deeply religious Jews and that no inspired writings are missing from our Bible today. Among the other scrolls, there are some which are their own writings, such as their own commentaries on some of the Old Testament books. There are also apocryphal and wisdom books, hymns and psalms, liturgies, theological works and rules for members of the Quamran community. It's clear from these that the sect to which they belonged adhered to a strict, almost military discipline and all members had to rigidly obey all rules and regulations or be expelled. Initiation was followed by a probationary year, then two years as a novice. On successful completion, the member was given a white linen robe and allowed to share in the common meal of bread and wine. A very long scroll, now known as the Temple Scroll, uh, lists all the regulations for worship in the temple, describes its arrangements, and gives instructions for keeping the people holy. A very handy scroll to have from a Jewish point of view in the event of building another temple at Jerusalem. The discovery of the scrolls naturally led to the question, who was it that hid them so long ago and why? Well, while Harding and Davu were excavating Cave 1, they noticed a ruin just above the, uh, the seashore um, on a plateau above the caves, which the Arabs called Kerbet Qumran. Kerbet means ruins. In this aerial picture on the screen, you can see the hillsides and their caves in the foreground and the ruins on top of the Qumran caves. Of course, the ruins are very pronounced now because they have since been uh, excavated. But when Harding and Davu first noticed them, all that could be seen above the ground was this, the stump of a ruined watchtower, which people had casually assumed to be the remains of an ancient Roman fort. The remains of it are still there today, um, about four metres high, about 13 feet high. But it has since been tidied up, as you can see in these um, later pictures. However, Harding and Davu believed that there could be a connection between the scrolls and the ruin. So they returned to the area in 1951 and they began to excavate. During 1951 to 1956, five major archaeological campaigns were conducted there. During the campaigns, they um, uncovered the ruins, the ruins of an elaborate central building complex, the main floor of which comprised more than 4,575 square metres, that's 15,000 square feet. It was a community centre or monastery with a massive tower for defence, an extensive kitchen and cooking department and a great assembly and uh, dining hall. The dining hall was over 20 metres at 70 feet long. These pictures were taken much later, of course, after the site was tidied up for the tourists. In one corner of the dining hall lay over 100 pottery vessels, perhaps ready for a meal. This picture on the screen was taken of them at the time that they were found by the, um, the researchers. They also unearthed a pantry, laundry, storerooms and uh, spacious courts. They also uncovered an impressive water system which brought water from the hills behind through a carved canal into many large roofless cisterns or 
pools such as the one you see in these pictures with the steps going down into it. The steps are nearly two metres wide and were fractured by an earthquake in 31 BC. Had this merely been a water um, storage tank, such wide steps would not have been necessary. So it's believed that numerous bathers used it as a ritual pool on a, uh, a regular basis. Remains of two parallel partition walls are evident on the upper steps, which may have created a central water channel flanked on either side by dry entrance and exit stairs. Originally, they may have looked something like these steps, which are divided by a railing. These descend into a, a mikvah found among the ruins in Jerusalem, which I had shown on a previous program. There were eight cisterns in the complex altogether, possibly a baptistry, because according to the records, the, commun the community did practice um, water baptism, that is complete immersion into um, water. <clears throat> I'll quickly um, show you a selection of the, uh, the cisterns. <clears throat> Nearby were stables for horses, a community pottery workshop, extensive pools for bathing and uh, ritual ablutions. In relation to these ruins, the cistern with double steps was on the other side of the wall on the left of this picture and the uh, oblong room um, uh, on that side, which you can see better here. It was originally a writing room known as the scriptorium, with a room over it, which was a, a writing room, which I'll say more about later. And in the small rooms on the right of our picture, scrolls were stored and studied. In another long room, barely visible in the background, ritual communal meals took place. The community's main cemetery lay on the terrace in the background behind the buildings, between the ruins and the Dead Sea, which you can see in the, uh, in the distance there. About 1,100 tombs are in this cemetery, and in those that have been excavated, nearly all the skeletons were those of males. The members of the community apparently uh, scorned private property in death as well as uh, in life because None of the graves in the cemetery contained the jewellery, weapons, tools and lamps commonly buried with the dead in other Middle Eastern countries. New members were required to give all their possessions to the community so they could be used for the common good of all. But beads and earrings found with female skeletons in smaller burial grounds nearby suggest that asceticism among the women did have its limits. Archaeological evidence of women and children here indicates that celibacy was not a general rule of the, uh, the community. Beyond the cemetery, um, a couple of kilometres to the south, along the shoreline of the Dead Sea, can be seen the green vegetation zone nourished by a large spring. Excavated buildings from the same period found near the spring suggest the community may have used the spring to support some modest agricultural um, activity. And many of the people lived in the caves which pock the slopes in the area. The complex that the archaeologists uncovered on this plateau was unique inasmuch it was, it was not a palace, it wasn't a fort, it wasn't a house. No one lived there. It was just a centre for all sorts of activities. Potters made and baked dishes, bowls, cups and jars. Farm produce was stored in silos and prepared uh, in the kitchen 
Weavers probably made wool from sheep and goats into clothing, and there was a dyeing plant to colour it and a laundry to wash it. What impressed the excavators most was the scriptorium or writing room, that long oblong room I pointed out um, previously. <clears throat> the room measured 13 metres by 4, that's 43 feet by 13 feet, and is seen again in this picture. In the ruins of this, the archaeologists came across the broken pieces of narrow masonry writing tables made of plastered brickwork. When they were pieced together, as you see here, they formed three benches. One of them was five metres, about 16 and a half feet long, and the other two were shorter. There was also a long bench attached to the wall. The layer of rubble on the floor suggested there must have been an upper story containing the writing room where most of the scrolls found in the caves originated. This drawing is an artist's impression of it. In the fallen debris of the room were found three ink wells, two of terracotta, that's hard clay pottery, and the other of bronze. You can see two of them here sitting on top of the reconstructed writing tables where they once stood when the original members of the Quamran community um, used them. One of the ink wells actually contained the residue of dried ink. And this dry ink powder was scientifically analysed and found to be made from carbon. It's uh, lamp black and gum. The ink wells clearly indicated the room was a writing place, obviously the place where the scrolls in the surrounding caves originated. An artist's impression of the uh, ancient scribes at work in the scriptorium, tirelessly copying and recopying portions of the scriptures, is presented in the next picture. A reader is seen dictating to two writers, and a third cleans his inkwell. Some uh, copy scrolls propped open with sticks, and others ceremoniously wash their hands before and after handling the scrolls. More scrolls can be seen resting in wall recesses. A double basin was found by the archaeologists, which was probably used for ritual washing before and after working with the sacred manuscripts, and this drawing is based on that. Also, the height of the writing tables was such that the scribes would have to kneel, not sit, as they copied the scriptures. This was probably done deliberately as an act of reverence for the word of God, which the scrolls, of course, represented. No scrolls or other written documents were found in the ruins of the community building at all. They were all in the caves all around the hillsides. Pottery found in the ruins was identical with pottery found in the caves. Also, a jar, large and uncommon in shape, found in the ruins was the same as the jars found in the cave with the first group of leather scrolls. In view of these facts, there's no good reason to doubt that the people who hid the scrolls in the caves were the people to whom the community building belonged. The Dead Sea Scrolls were definitely the library of Quam Ran. There can be no doubt about that. The rules about the way of life recorded in some of the scrolls agree in general with descriptions we have from other historical writings of a Jewish sect called the Essenes, which means the people of the scrolls. These were the people whom the historian Josephus, Philo and Pliny, the elder, had described as having split off from the Orthodox Judaism in Jerusalem and removed themselves from the evils and the wrongs that surge up in cities. The Essenes repudiated worship 
at the Herodian temple in Jerusalem, which they considered corrupt. They disagreed with its grandiose style and design and the rules that governed worship there. In one of their scrolls, called the Temple Scroll, the longest of the Dead Sea Scrolls, being eight and a half metres, about 28 feet long, <clears throat> nearly half of it deals with rules they thought should have been used to build the temple and uh, worship in it. <clears throat> As a result of studying the elaborate instructions in the Temple Scroll, Yigo Yarden prepared this plan of the temple which the Essenes hoped would be built in Jerusalem. Yarden was convinced that the temple concept of the scroll's author was based on the design of the camp of Israel set around the tabernacle in the wilderness according to tribes and Levitical families. As you can see, three square courts are involved, the inner, the middle and the outer. The outer court measures 1,500 cubits by 1,500. That's about 670 metres square, or 2,200 feet square. And a moat ran around it to separate it from the city. The middle court measures 500 cubits by 500. That's 230 metres square, or 750 feet square. Both the outer and middle courts have 12 gates named after Jacob's 12 sons and assigned in the, uh, the same order around each court. The outer court was also divided in such a way to make provision for the priests, the three sons of Levi and two sons of Aaron. The inner court, which you see an enlargement of here, is 300 cubits by 300 about 450 feet square or 137 metres square. It consists of four gates oriented to the four points of the compass. Within this court, of course, is the temple proper, the laver and the altar, etc. But coming back to the Quamran complex, here is a plan of it. Its shape resembles a prancing horse. The red dots represent the cisterns. There were... Um, eight of those. The blue area is the writing room and the green area is the kitchen. <clears throat> Several artists have given their impressions of the Quamran complex. As I mentioned before, the, uh, the Essenes didn't live in the community building, but all around the area in tents and booths and in caves. Being a hot, dry climate, it would have been cooler and much more comfortable in the, uh, in the caves. Here's another couple artist's impressions of what the, uh, the complex looked like. <clears throat> and this here is actually a model, a model of the Quamran complex, which is uh, in the Masada Museum. They also probably felt it was more in keeping with the spirit of Abraham to live a more simple and chaste life in caves in the wilderness, shunning the cities which they regarded as impure and worldly, unworthy of inheriting the new Jerusalem and kingdom of God, which they believed was at hand for uh, Israel. The Essenes were totally dedicated to godliness and cleanliness, and they saw themselves as an elect within the elect. They believed that salvation could only be obtained by members of their own sect. So there was quite an elitist and separatist spirit. It was sectarianism in an extreme form. According to their writings, they considered themselves to be called upon to go into the desert to prepare the way of the Lord, as it is written in Isaiah chapter 40. Their faith and their purpose and mission in life must have received a great uplift and even a small measure of confirmation from the preaching of John the Baptist, who, you remember, quoted those words in Isaiah 40 and applied them to his ministry of preparing the way for Christ's ministry. 
The Essenes had taught repentance as a necessary prerequisite to baptism, as did John the Baptist. They also believed that the Messiah was about to appear and that the age of consummation was at hand, as did John the Baptist. Initially, when these facts emerged from the scrolls, many started to conclude that Christianity was just an offshoot from the Essenes, that John the Baptist and Jesus were merely members of the community and had borrowed their teaching from there. In other words, that Jesus was just a product of his times and not an original, unique figure at all. But as more information came from the scrolls, the differences between Essenism and Christianity grew greater. For example, the Essenes expected two messiahs, a priestly messiah of Aaron of the tribe of Levi and a royal messiah of David of the tribe of Judah, as well as a third prophetic figure. But according to the Christian faith, all three offices of priest, king and prophet are fused into and fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ, who was of the tribe of Judah. Secondly, ritual baptisms were repeated many times for each individual by the Essenes. But in the Christian faith, there's only one water baptism for believers. As we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Thirdly, Jesus welcomed everyone, women, the handicapped, and the diseased, but the Essenes didn't. They were quite discriminatory. Fourthly, the Essenes expected the Messiah to come with a metal sword and fire, and they were ready and prepared to follow him as the sons of light, with swords to slay the sons of darkness. That is, everyone who didn't see things their way and who didn't belong to their sect. Jesus, however, didn't bring such a sword and spoke against using such weapons and force. He taught that, quote, he who takes up the sword shall perish by the sword. Also, he said, if anybody smites you on the cheek, well then turn the other cheek. If anyone compels you to go a mile, well then walk an extra mile. Fifthly, the Essenes stressed love of the insider and hatred of the enemy, while Jesus stressed love for all, including enemies. The Essene teaching resulted in their disciples becoming an introverted, isolated, exclusive community. But Jesus sent his disciples right out into the thick of the world to find and to help the lost. Sixthly, the Essenes taught a meticulous observance of the Jewish ritual laws, including offering animal sacrifices. But the New Testament church taught that such laws had been done away through the sacrifice of Jesus. <clears throat> the concept of one man's death making atonement for all mankind, not for Israel only, but Gentiles as well, would have been as big a stumbling block to the Essenes as the other Jewish sects. But to those who believe, it's the power of God unto salvation, irrespective of nationality. God is no respecter of persons. Time has demonstrated another major difference. The teaching of the Essenes failed to bring them through the war with Rome and tribulation, but Christ lit a flame which persists to the present day. The Romans put him to death, but he rose again and will raise all who believe in him on the last day. The gates of hell prevailed against the sect of the Essenes, but not against the Christian church, which has survived the passage of time. It's important to realise that the Dead Sea Scrolls relating to the Essene community present only one part of Jewish thought at that time. The Essenes were only one of a number of sects in Israel, which had similar traditions to the others 
and who believed the kingdom of God was near. Early Christianity arose in the context of the whole, but was quite separate <clears throat> and distinct from them all. From the commentaries and rule books of the Essenes, we can pick up clues about the origin of their authors. They respected a man called the teacher of righteousness, and much of their distinctive thought seems to stem from him. As far as can be learnt from the scrolls, he lived in the middle of the second century BC. He held unusual views about the dates of the main Jewish festivals, and so the priests in Jerusalem stopped him celebrating the uh, holy days because they were not at the same time as their own. The teacher was persecuted, especially by the ruling priest in Jerusalem, so he led his disciples to the refuge of Quamran in the wilderness. As a matter of interest, an article in Time magazine, August the 14th, 1989, on the Dead Sea Scrolls says this, quote, Years ago, writers speculated that the New Testament accounts of Jesus Christ could have been patterned after this early teacher. But such theories lack textual support and have died out. Columbia University's Theodore Gaster thinks the teacher was not even a specific person and that the title was used by a succession of leaders. The Essenes apparently used the remains of a fort at Qumran, which dated back to the Old Testament time of King Hezekiah or Josiah, that's around 600-700 BC, and they extended the original building. They probably originated as a, a priestly group within the general opposition to the Hellenization, that is, against the superimposing of Greek philosophy upon the word of God. They established their headquarters at Quamran around 150 BC, and they remained there for just over 200 years. That is roughly the period the building was in use. They survived a disastrous earthquake in AD 31, which shattered the buildings, the effects of which have been found by the archaeologists. The date of the earthquake is known because the Jewish historian Josephus refers to it. So the archaeologists were able to date the structure accurately at the time of its destruction before it was rebuilt. The Essene community at Quamran came to an abrupt end in AD 68. In that year, Vespasian's Roman troops of the 10th Legion marched through Palestine to crush the first Jewish um, revolt, which was caused by fanatical zealots. Much prayer would have been offered by the Essenes, no doubt, but to no avail. The Romans laid siege to Jerusalem, then Jericho, and then their troops marched on down to the Dead Sea area, and the Essenes knew they were coming, as is depicted in this picture. There they are up in the caves looking down on the Roman armies coming through the valley. On the eve of the onslaught, members of the Quamran community decided it was time to hide their sacred scrolls and flee for safety. So they began gathering up their parchments, wrapping them in linen, placing them in large storage jars. But the disaster must have come quickly, for they apparently piled many scrolls in the caves at the last minute without protection. Of these, the ravages of time, rats, worms and falling debris have left only fragments. The final fate of the Essenes is unknown. Perhaps they died defending their headquarters at Quamran, or perhaps they fled to the caves to hide and were hunted down by the Romans, or perhaps some of them fled south to the fortress at Masada, where the Jews took their last stand against the Romans. 
more than 700 coins were found at Quam Ran, which provide almost continuous sequence for the 200 years of Essene history there. Some of the coins include Jewish ones up to the year 68 AD, but none later. Fire and mining destroyed the, uh, the building. The Roman soldiers turned part of it into a lookout post. Their coins, minted between AD 65 and 73, also lay in the ruins of their room, rooms. After using Quamran as a fort for some time, the Roman soldiers left and the place remained empty until the Second Jewish Revolt in AD 132-135 when the ruins were temporarily used as a stronghold or a hiding place. Later, during the next 1800 years, the desert took possession of the area until the Bedouin boy's wandering goat led to a stone finding the scrolls which resulted in archaeologists rescuing the literary treasures, bringing them out of their hiding places for the world to see. A steady stream of travellers from all over the world come to see the scrolls. And a modern tar-sealed highway seen in this picture brings motor vehicles and tourist buses down to the caves and to the Quamran settlement. Most of you will probably never get to uh, visit the area or get to see the scrolls, but we do all have access to the contents of the scrolls, translated into English in the Bible. And what a voyage of discovery it can be if we're prepared to open up that book <clears throat> and prayerfully peruse its pages. As we read in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and uh, it is profitable in every respect, able to make us wise unto salvation. Well, that brings us to the end of that um, program. Next time um, that I'm um, sharing, we're going to travel 30 miles south, 50 kilometres, south of Quamran, down the western shore of the Dead Sea to another equally famous site, namely Masada, which in Hebrew means mountain fortress. It was one of the world's most startling natural fortifications, having cliffs that rise 1,400 feet, about 427 metres. Herod the Great established the fortress just before the time of Christ and equipped it with the huge water cisterns, hot baths, etc., etc., and built two splendid palaces there. Later, the Jewish zealots took it over, made their last stand there against the Romans for freedom and independence. When the Romans finally broke in, the 960 defenders had defiantly committed suicide rather than be taken alive and large-scale archaeological excavations have taken place at Masada, bringing to light many interesting details of its past glory, and that's what I'll be sharing next time that I'll be um, continuing this series. <clears throat>